Ladies and gentlemen, we have one more session at the first Virtual Horizon 2020 Summit. In this uh, uh, session, we have uh, uh, one familiar uh, person, uh, professional. It is Professor Mark Reeve that we had it uh, uh, also for discussing uh, the impact section in uh, general by giving some tips because he's a really uh, an expert in that area. However, while we had his uh, session, he suggested also his website that uh, under that he had a lot of uh, free and available resources related to impact. I had a look to uh, some of them and I have to admit that I was really impressed. I'm impressed uh, with, uh, first of all, with uh, the value and the volume that he shares for free. And he gives also some uh, free templates on how to measure impact, how to analyze uh, impact, which is essential in Horizon 2020 uh, grant applications. But also, he gives uh, some other further tips uh, how to connect with uh, Evernote as well and measure the impact, as well as uh, uh, some examples of uh, grant uh, schemes uh, related to impact in order to get, uh, I mean, a very good idea on how to deal with this impact session that a lot of uh, grant applicants really do not have a very clear idea how to deal with. So, Mark, welcome you once more in the first visual summit. Great, thank you very much. Um, first of all, just by way of introduction, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to delve into some, some more depth here. This is stuff that I am passionate about. Uh, this is for me, not just about writing um, a fantastic section of your grant application that gets you the funding. These are tools that also then, when you get that funding, enable you to achieve impacts which are deeper, which are more meaningful, which are longer lasting, and which, because you designed them effectively, are time efficient in their achievement. So um, what I've done, over the last decade is uh, I have, um, as a, a, a full-time research professor, been studying processes of research impact, um, and many of my peer-reviewed journal articles uh, are about what I have learned uh, about the processes of knowledge exchange, of engagement, of commercialization, of, of various different types of impact. Um, and uh, I have developed tools, uh, some of which are my own, uh, some of which are adaptations of existing tools, which have been tweaked based on the research evidence of what actually works in the context of a research project. Uh, and uh, of course, these are all uh, publicly available through my peer reviewed um, publications, but uh, through my spin out company, Fast Track Impact, I try to then make these even more accessible, uh, more easy to use, um, so that uh, my work can have as big an impact as possible. Um, so, so what I'll do is I'll baby. just show you. Um, your baby, I understand, Mike. So you're very proud yes. of it. It is your baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to have a look at that. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll, uh, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you my, uh, my website um, so you can uh, see, see what this looks like. And I'll um, then um, show you through some of these uh, tools. And I'll actually show you how they work. So if you want, you can. Uh, log on to your own browser and uh, look at this um, perhaps at higher resolution and see this for yourself as I'm going. This is uh, fasttrackimpact.com. Um, and, uh, and then just click on the resources page. Nicholas. Yes, this is what I'm doing exactly. I'm, I'm following exactly your paradigm. Great, it's working. Good. So uh, on the resources page, you can see lots of things. Um, so the one thing that I do charge for is my book, sadly. Uh, but there's also my free uh, uh, magazine, uh, my weekly podcast, uh, lots of other video resources. Um, and here are the templates. Um, I'll start just by um, showing you my best practice library. Now, this is something that I've only just launched. This is uh, very young, very early. Uh, and um, I'm keen to get more people to uh, submit examples to me of what they believe is good practice uh, for their area. Uh, so, so far this uh, is focusing on um, examples from uh, UK <coughs> research funders. Uh, and you can see on my screen here um, the, the range. We've got pretty much every kind of discipline uh, represented here. Uh, and you can see that uh, in addition to the example, 
Um, you can see some of the background, uh, so the summary and objectives. It says a link to a project website. So you can see the context in which that was developed when it was submitted. Um, uh, if available, um, I have feedback from the reviewers or the panel um, on the impact element of the research, what the funders thought was good and why they funded it. Um, uh, and then I provided my own evaluation. Now, of course, no um, impact section of a grant is 100% perfect. And so I've chosen these because I think that each of them show very good practice examples of things that you can do that are excellent. Uh, but there are, of course, some things that perhaps are not quite so good. And so in my feedback, I have highlighted things which I think could be improved. Uh, as well as the reasons why I have selected this as uh, good practice. Uh, and the reason I've done this is that I believe that by sharing good practice in this way, that we can drive up standards, uh, both in terms of the uh, pre-award process, what we submit to our funders, but also in terms of actually having plans that work so that when we get funding, we're much more likely to actually deliver impact as well. And I believe that uh, the way that this works is that good ideas spread. That's how innovation works. Uh, so look through these ideas, choose the things which that really uh, spark your imagination that you believe are innovative and build on them and then share your innovations so that we can spread those good practices and those innovations as widely as possible. So I'll let you look through at that and your own time. Um, linked to this is um, a blog uh, where I have uh, distilled um, advice on all the things that you need to have in uh, the impact sections of uh, a grant. Uh, lots of useful advice on here, links to resources, um, uh, key, key things. Um, I think I've got um, yeah, 10 key things that you really need to have if you want this to, to be credible. Um, uh, and I believe that this, this really can help. And uh, Mark, you have examples for each one of those 10 things that you need to address, 10 checklists on how to, to write an, an impact. You give some instructions, that's very clear, but also some, yes, some, some yeah. examples. So for example, for, for me, specificity equals credibility um, in this. And I think my, my number one piece of advice, if I'm going to look at one of these things, is be specific. It's very hard to prove that you will generate impact uh, and reviewers will look at what you are writing. And if this is specific now the, to the level of uh, named individuals sometimes, or at least uh, a group or a department within uh, a government or an agency, uh, then this now makes the reviewers believe that, uh, that this team does know their target audience that does know who they need to reach out to and it, it, they will be able to achieve impact rather than, well, yeah, we're going to work, work with supermarkets. And everyone knows how difficult it is to actually get supermarkets to engage with researchers um, and uh, actually get them to answer your emails, let alone pick up the phone and engage in any meaningful way with your research. And so if I'm uh, including hard to reach stakeholders, I will always be as specific as I can and say, now, this is the head of corporate social responsibility, the head of sustainability. We have spoken to this person. They have joined our uh, advisory panel. Believe us, when we say we're going to work with supermarkets, we really will. And the reviewers then believe you. Uh, and so when you look at the best practice, practice library, uh, I will draw out in my uh, evaluation uh, some of the examples of things which I thought were very specific and as a result very credible. Uh, so you can see examples of how people have uh, enacted these principles uh, in, in actual examples to very different funders working on very different kinds of, of research. Very good. So so if I go back um, to my resources page, um, I thought I would maybe um, uh, just uh, point you to two out of the, the four impact templates uh, that I use most frequently. Um, there are four here, so you can have a look in your own time at my social media strategy template and my impact tracking template. Um, uh, and I'm choosing uh, the, the first of these uh, as the stakeholder and public analysis templates. And 
Um, the, the, the reason that I'm highlighting this is because um, through the research that I've done and what I'm trying to do with my company, I'm trying to promote a relational approach to impact. So this is not just simply about getting your funding, ticking the, that box, using stakeholders to get impact for instrumental reasons. This is actually about people, it's about trust, it's about relationships. And for me, the tool that enables me to uh, achieve the level of empathy I need to create genuine, meaningful, lasting impact is it, it, this one here. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, zoom into this. Uh, in fact, um, tell you what, before I do that, I'm, I'm going to go back to my blog and I'm going to zoom into um, this, this diagram, which you can see on, on the page here. Um, because uh, this is the, the kind of the, the theory behind it, the principle behind how um, a stakeholder or public analysis works. Uh, and this is how it was originally proposed in the business management literature. I've uh, adapted this through my own publications. Um, but to understand the principle, what it suggests is that uh, any of your publics or stakeholders for a particular research project will vary in their relative level of interest in your research. So there'll be some who will be hugely interested, who will answer your emails, will come along to all your meetings and events, and others who are just not that interested, they're much more peripheral. But there is another axis here, uh, and that axis um, I uh, vary depending on whether I'm working primarily with publics uh, or with stakeholders. So if I'm working with publics, uh, the first thing that I'm recognising is that there is no such thing as the general public. Uh, there are different publics who have different interests, who have different characteristics, different educational statuses, um, uh, different barriers, different languages. Uh, they, these are different groups who you will need to treat differently. Uh, and uh, in particular, I'm looking now not only at how interested are these different publics, I'm also looking at what is the rel relative level of benefit that these uh, publics might have. And so that means that there are then, uh, in the top right quadrant, highly interested uh, stakeholders who will benefit highly, easy to reach, target publics. Great, they come along, they pack out your lecture theatre, they engage with your online activities, etc. Fine. What is challenging, uh, and what this tool helps us not to forget, is that there are two very important, hard to reach publics. The first in the top uh, left quadrant um, recognises that there may be stakeholders, uh, sorry, may be publics out there that would benefit enormously from engaging with your work if only you could actually persuade them to engage with you. The bottom line, however, is they're not actually that interested. The way you framed it, uh, the barriers that exist between you and them mean that they will not come to you. You will have to come to them. You will need to reframe uh, and think very carefully about how you can motivate them to engage with you if they are to actually uh, receive the benefits that you believe they could receive if you uh, could reach them. The other easy to, uh, uh, easy to reach group, um, uh, but also, um, sorry, this is problematic. So they're, they're easy to reach, they're not hard to reach, um, but they're not your target public. So uh, in the bottom right hand quadrant, you've got people who are hugely interested in what you're doing, but actually compared to other publics, they're not that interested. Uh, now, for most of us, we don't worry too much about this, but um, sometimes we can be fooled into a false sense of security because these kind of people come along to things and they don't benefit that much. So, for example, I might do a public outreach event and I do it on campus. Uh, and as a result, actually, the vast majority of people are staff and students and actually the young people affected by gun crime that I actually want to reach in the community beyond my university don't come. Uh, and actually, I need to make sure that I am reaching those. Same thing applies to stakeholders then. Um, uh, this time, I've uh, still got the interest axis, but I've now replaced this uh, idea of benefit with the idea of influence. So who is uh, the stakeholder who will be most interested, but also most influential? Uh, and in that top right quadrant, you have a bunch of stakeholders who will probably uh, already be um, known to you. But at this point, it's worth bearing in mind that they may be known to you because they love what you do and they want to facilitate you and help you to achieve impact, 
but they also may be well known to you because they hate what you do and they want to block you and prevent you from achieving impact. Um, so make sure you know who these groups are. Uh, they will typically engage with you because they're interested enough. But uh, again, make sure you don't forget the hard to reach but influential stakeholders. These could be gatekeepers, organizations or individuals who will prevent you from getting access to data, to people, to sites, etc. cetera. Uh, but they're not, not that interested in what you're doing. So you need to work out how you can engage them and make them interested enough that they talk to you and you resolve those issues so you can do your work and achieve impact. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are these stakeholders in the bottom right who are hugely interested, but not that influential. And the moral question now becomes, well, do we just ignore these because we are time poor? Uh, or actually, do we use our project, our research, to now empower marginalised, voiceless stakeholder groups by joining them into our stakeholder panels, our events, our meetings, and actually uh, creating strategic alliances now between those much less powerful groups and the more powerful groups whose interests uh, align. Uh, I think the, the, the final take-home message from, from these diagrams is that this is about helping you to prioritise, and if you do nothing else, uh, using a systematic tool like this enables you to decide who is the one organization or the one person I will reach out to. And so by the end of this month, you make that one point and uh, that one person, you talk to them, you are closer to impact. So now with the uh, template... Mark, one, one yeah, moment. carry on. Ask on this uh, diagram. So first of all, um, uh, the difference between publics and stakeholders is... Uh, if we can say interest groups that have expect to have some benefit, then we call them publics, and interest groups that expect to have some influence, either negative or positive, we call them stakeholders. Can we say something like that based on the diagram and the distinction? Yeah, um, to be honest, we can get tied up in knots with definitions on this, and for most people, this is kind of an intrinsic thing that you just kind of feel your way towards. And rather than getting tied up in um, uh, in definitions, uh, if yeah, ask yourself the question: um, uh, Is this someone who will benefit? And if not, is this someone who can have influence? Uh, and if you want, you can actually ask answer both of those questions for any of these people. Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the problem with this is that this is a tool that was developed for working with stakeholders uh, and as a result um, people uh, don't typically, typically use this as a tool for working around benefit and working around much uh, broader uh, and more numerous groups of, of publics. Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make here is don't just restrict a tool like this to identifying large stakeholder organisations use this also to identify uh, stakeholder groups, uh, groups of people that would be defined as publics, public representative organizations as well, and think not only about how influential are these people, but how high uh, benefit um, can they get from this. <coughs> so for, for, if I explain how this works in terms of like, it may make more sense. Just one question, Mark, if I may, now that you're showing this. Uh, our top priority should actually be the ones that are at the uh, top right quadrant, either in the publics or in the stakeholders' uh, uh, diagram. Yeah, you can choose to use this in different ways. Um, so, uh, in fact, um, uh, at the end of this uh, tool here, um, I do a bit of analysis um, and identify the hard to reach groups, the top left groups, and I identify them at the outset because actually those are the groups which are often most problematic that will often take the longest to work out a pathway to impact for or with. Um, and so I want to know who they are up front. Uh, so I have time to work um, on reaching those groups. And very often the top right are actually much easier for me. Um, but if actually I, I, I do this analysis and I discover there are a whole load of organizations in the top right that I didn't know about before, then yes, that's easy, that's quick, reach out to them, fantastic. Uh, so you can choose how you want to use this as a 
you know, a really quick and dirty tool to say, right, who are the really important people? Let's make sure I've got two or three of them and I leave the rest till later. Uh, or actually a, a more comprehensive analysis that means that you can take a more full view on this and say, well, actually, these are the easy guys, but actually are there other people that I should be reaching out to, um, whether or not that's going to be easy. Okay. <clears throat> well, so if I show you how this works, um, uh, for, for me, the, the traditional way of doing this is on this, this combo two matrix. Um, and what I don't like about this is that when you do this with a group of people, you have all this rich discussion about, well, these guys should be here. No, they should be over here. And actually the reasons why one person thinks a group is more or less influential than another are actually the information you need most as a researcher to be able to pitch your pathway to impact um, and to actually work constructively with those organizations. And that detail is lost from the analysis. So what I'm doing now is I'm identifying the name of an organization or group. Um, and quite quickly now I'm asking myself, how interested do I think they are? High, medium or low? It's quite subjective, so I'm moving on quite quickly now and asking, well, what aspects of the research are they actually likely to be interested in? So rather than just high or low interest, I'm now defining what is the nature of that interest and I'm anchoring that nature of interest in, um, in my research. And that is really important in terms of then writing your uh, impact sections of your grant because, well, in my case, I could work with the National Farmers Union uh, and I could put lots and lots of different interests that the Farmers Union might have. But actually, in relation to my research project, it's just one working group within the Farmers Union that has an interest. And actually, although the Farmers Union might be hugely influential, uh, the group that is interested in my research are the least influential of that whole organization. And now I have a very different answer uh, and something which I can use much more specifically now to create a credible pathway to impact. So obviously the next thing is I know what the nature of their interest is. Uh, what is the level of influence they might have or the level of benefit, high, medium or low? Hey, the public uh, level one, one the comment system, on the previous... Level of one, sorry, one comment on the third column. You say identify key messages linked directly to your research for this group. Can you give us some examples of key messages? Yeah, so um, the example I had there um, with the, uh, the Farmers Union, um, I've done some, some research uh, where we've been uh, looking at um, uh, farmers, practitioners, uh, policy makers, businesses. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, peat bogs, uh, peatlands. Uh, and so uh, to, uh, to one group, um, we think that there's probably going to be a, a bunch of messages. So for the, uh, for the businesses, there's a bunch of messages which we know we will be able to say around the value of nature. Um, so we might be able to put a price tag on some of these things. We might be able to say something more sophisticated about the value of nature, which tells a really positive story about the contribution that this habitat makes to the UK society. Um, uh, and as a result, then a pathway to impact with businesses, which says, get involved in this, put funding into nature conservation, and you can be part of this positive success story. At the same time, um, we know that our research will also provide messages for policymakers, which are kind of the opposite. And actually, for the policymakers, we're emphasizing how far short we are falling of meeting EU directives of other national legislative targets, how big our problem is, and what engaging with the private sector um, and putting public money in might do to then get multiple win-wins for policy. And we don't yet know what the figures are that we'll get. We don't know how big that gap is. We haven't done the research, but we know that there will be two very different types of message for those two very different types of stakeholder emerging from this research. And as a result, we can start to now start thinking about what kind of steps and activities we might take with those two very different groups to achieve those two very different types of impact around their interests in our work. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so moving to uh, influence or, or benefit now, I, I've graded this as high, medium or low, quite subjective, so I'm moving on and I'm now really exploring why. Why is this organization so influential? 
why uh, do I think that despite the influence of that organization, the group that is most interested in my research is so much less influential? Um, okay, I think this public will benefit significantly from this. How? What will be those, uh, those benefits? Um, and at this point, you can see, hopefully, that this is a tool that can structure your thinking as an individual. So if you are the person writing this grant, uh, then simply going through this process helps you to sort out your thinking and, and, and makes you do better work. Uh, if you do this then with your research group, your colleagues, then you can do even more effective work through discussion. Uh, what I like to do, if I can, and I can't always do this, but I don't always have time, I will then say hey, let's have a, a two hour maybe three hour workshop let's invite two or three key stakeholders into the room you don't have time for that the key thing is to identify where there are gaps in your knowledge and it may be that well of course in theory the farmers ought to be interested in my research but i'm not quite sure how they would benefit i'm not sure why the union might be powerful or not um, and in that case that question mark then prompts you to now ask very targeted specific questions of well is the farmers union influential or not and what benefits would farmers get and maybe you can go and talk to some real farmers and actually get answers to my questions the point is that this is helping us to be much more systematic uh, and comprehensive in our thinking uh, and as a result of doing this now i have many stakeholders many publics identified I can now take a bird's eye view of this and start to group these into much broader groups of interest. So for or against um, conservation versus uh, environment versus uh, economy or whatever way I want to group that so that I can present that more efficiently in my, in my pathway to impact. I can start to identify of, of all of these who am I going to invite to be part of a, a, an advisory panel? And I can do that in a much more systematic and, and powerful way. The final column here is one of the bits of analysis you can do, um, and, and you can have lots of different columns on here. I'm using this to go through, and I'm just scanning through all the rows. Who has uh, low interest, but high influence or high benefit? Uh, that is someone who's going to be a hard to reach group. And that may be a problematic group that I need to give more thought to. Uh, and, and I'm tagging that for me personally as the first thing I want to now go and investigate and think about more deeply. Um, but you can do uh, any, any number of different things with this as a tool. So that is my stakeholder and public analysis template. So I guess and if you want to cite this, of course. I find it's quite useful in a, in a proposal to be able to actually provide references to the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, if you look at profmarkread.com, my publication list, search for a stakeholder, I guess, um, and you'll see I've got two, two publications um, that you can potentially cite to say I've used um, this as a tool and this is a, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a real thing and it exists in the peer-reviewed literature. Where can we go with addresses that, that we can find a completed example based on that template? You said something? Mark? Um, so uh, what I'm going to do then is actually, if it's okay, I, I will show you um, my impact planning template and this has a worked example in it. So if you uh -huh. scroll down my impact planning template, it's the second of the two templates. Yes. Um, and this is the example I was giving you earlier on. Um, and you will see that uh, columns two and three of the uh, of this of this template uh, are basically from your stakeholder analysis so mm -hmm. if you are very time poor uh, and you think you've got one hour to use one of these templates if you use this template that one hour will make the difference for you um, uh, and it has the the key elements of a stakeholder or public analysis in there the reason that i believe it is important to do that properly using the stakeholder public analysis template first is that that set when you do it properly enables you you to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you want to work with and benefit uh, and you're more able to then use this relational approach and this tool then happens a lot quicker and you can use this tool more effectively but if you're time poor and you choose one tool choose this tool because it integrates both of them and in the worked example you can now see uh, the target stakeholders or publics uh, and the reasons that they are interested in the project um, and in this case i have uh, grouped them uh, in, in relation to my goal um, i can make other examples available where i've grouped them in different ways um, so i now have a number of different stakeholder organizations 
um, grouped under the same goal because actually they will have very different interests in that goal. Um, uh, and uh, just, uh, you probably can't read this on the screen, download this, you can have a look at it in more depth, but you can see now that what's happening is that I have been able to work back from my stakeholder analysis to come up with an impact goal. Now, um, this is uh, a logic model. So logic models work by driving from a goal. Uh, and so in theory, you have to start with a goal. Now, the problem that I have is when I work with researchers using these tools, most researchers tell me, and actually I find myself as a researcher, coming up with a convincing impact goal is the hardest thing. Uh, and so you need a technique that can help you to make this easy. So rather than worrying about that and not starting, I start with the question I can answer, which is who, anyone, someone, somewhere who is interested in my research, who is that person, and what is their interest in my, in my work? And if I know what they're interested in, then what might, I think, it, what, what, what reason might they be interested in my research for? Uh, and what benefit might they get? And at this point, your impact goal might be quite vague, not very well defined, um, but you've got something in there. So a vague kind of benefit around this. Um, and once I've got a vague impact goal that I know is of interest to uh, certain specific stakeholders or publics who are interested in particular parts of my research, so this is not just general interest, but it's being driven from the research outputs, only then can I start to identify activities that would engage that particular group around that part of the research to achieve something that would be beneficial or meaningful. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they start with this column, they start with the activities. So probably the most common one is they start with a digital strategy. I'm going to Euro web Sites and we're going to have a, a, a massive social media strategy, etc., uh, without actually looking and seeing whether or not your target publics and stakeholders are on social media. They're even online, they're even literate. Um, and actually, you may be wasting a lot of time unless you actually start with the people and the benefits that they might get. So, you've now got um, a really nicely structured goal with target stakeholders and publics around particular parts of the research and now specific activities that you can do which you can start to cost into your proposal. Um, uh, and at this point, um, I want to start to get a bit more specific. So that impact goal is still a little bit too vague. Um, uh, and I'm doing two things now. I'm looking, at, uh, I'm looking for indicators. And I'm looking for indicators, first of all, of successful engagement. So how do I know that my activities that I've planned will work? Now for social media, great, easy, we get metrics. Um, uh, I've invited people to a, to a meeting, to a seminar, nobody turned up. I now need to know why that happens. Uh, and these indicators of, uh, of successful engagement are really useful as formative feedback that can help uh, me to actually course correct uh, and make sure that I continue on a pathway that will actually achieve impact. But the second type of indicator I look for now is indicators uh, of progress towards impact. This could be telling me I have achieved my impact, or they could just be telling me I've, ch I've achieved milestones along my pathway to impact. Uh, and in each case, I'm asking the researcher to not just come up with a, an indicator, but actually tell me how will you measure that? What data will you collect? Even if that's qualitative data, how will you be able to do this? And instantly, very often, you discover actually, I need to be a bit more specific. Uh, or actually, I need to have a budget for this because that's going to be very difficult to do. Um, and uh, this, if someone is really struggling, I actually ask them to close their eyes and imagine that they are standing five years from now, they've completed the research. What can you see? What can you hear? What are people are telling you has changed for them? Um, uh, and to use this to come up with those indicators that you can track. Um, and actually that process now helps you to see much more clearly what your impact goal is. And you can now revisit that impact goal. And with that really specific, measurable thinking about what it is that you hope to see, you can turn that vague goal into a smart goal. So it's specific, measurable, um, achievable, realistic, and time-bound as far as possible. And then finally, uh, as you're thinking about this, you'll probably come up with a bunch of risks, things that could go badly wrong in terms of your activities, in terms of your impacts. Uh, and rather than just putting that aside um, and, and, and ignoring it, you're capturing that and you're identifying those risks and how you're going to mitigate them. 
uh, if a reviewer spots those risks um, and the, the panel members spot those risks and they're big and you haven't identified them and you haven't identified how you will mitigate them, uh, then your proposal could go down. Um, so it's, it's always worth capturing that stuff. And then finally, a couple of columns on who's responsible, what resources do we need, timing, we're building this stuff into our Gantt chart, our project plan, as much as we are our, our work packages and uh, our work plan for the science. Wow, what a nice table, uh, Mark. I really, really liked it. And I think that uh, <laughs> in any proposal, but specifically in Horizon 2020, you have such a, a table structure of what will be your strategy in order to achieve the expected impact. You have a lot of chances to have a winning proposal. Because I guess that uh, we could change the first column and, and the impact goal, instead of having the impact goal there, we can take at least expected impact that are mentioned in the work program specifically in the other yes. topic in Horizon 2020. Yes. Yes, and this is exactly what I do when I'm uh, using this tool for a Horizon 2020 bid. Exactly. Um, and you can you know, use a table like this in your bid, um, it, but it will be very much in summary form. Um, so uh, I guess similar to the kind of level of detail you might have in the work example I've, I've given here. Um, uh, in terms of a working document, very often you will need a lot, a lot more detail than this. Um, uh, and for me, what is quite useful about this is pre-award, if, if I can think now about all the different <coughs> stakeholders who might be interested, all the different activities I could choose from. Um, and now actually I can take a bird's eye view of this and look down on this and say, right, actually, if I've got limited resources, if I've got limited time, actually, which of these pathways for which of these stakeholders do I want to prioritise? And very often, uh, I will only actually put a smaller number of these into uh, the impact section of my grant proposal. Uh, and I have those other things in my mind, um, and, uh, and I may uh, actually try and do them uh, in reality, but they're high risk. Um, they're uncertain, uh, they might um, require more resources than I think I have available, and I don't know if I'll have access to that. So rather than adding risk to my proposal, I might keep them out uh, and just focus on the ones that I believe are going to, to play well to the panel and, and be low risk, high likelihood of actually achieving impact. Um, but you have the ability to pick and choose and be more strategic when you have all of this in front of you, uh, rather than just doing it from scratch one by one. Excellent. And I guess that uh, what you can have is for uh, a different target stakeholders, a different role in your table, because in that case, you might have different reasons that this target group or stakeholder is interested in the project, or you might need to engage different activities for engaging this target group. So your strategy in order to look coherent, you need to add uh, roles, one after the other, for each stuff different uh, stakeholder because you might change the data in each cell as you're going through your impact analysis. Very, very nice. I'm really fond of tables and I really like this table. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so this, this is the tool that you use to then power the rest of uh, the, the impact sections of your proposal. It's all in one place. It's quite you can see it, you can take those procedure decisions, you can then dive into detail, dive into depth, and, uh, and tool a, a particular pathway out of, of, a, of a table like this. Um, I've developed this um, based on um, uh, a, the logic model kind of framework. Um, there are other logic models out there. Um, so, for example, in the international development community, people use logical framework analysis. I find when I train people in logical framework analysis, we will get all tied up in knots uh, about the difference between uh, an output and an outcome, and it gets very confusing. So I've designed this um, based on years of experience training researchers as to what you actually need to boil this down to something that will work in the context of a research project. Um, but uh, what, what is more useful to think about, um, if you really want to go into much more depth on this, um, is another tool from the international development community, which is uh, a theory of change. Um, uh, and uh, the, what it, I guess the key contribution that the, the theory of change makes to our thinking on this is just recognising that for any particular kind of outcome that you might want, not only are there different stakeholders and publics that you will want to engage, with any one of those stakeholders and publics, there may actually be more than one pathway you could follow. Uh, and it may be that for some of these, you may want to pursue um, two or three alternative pathways to reach that point. 
And I think for me, the most common um, reason that we need to do, do this is where we are doing very contentious research. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. And we know that if we have outcome A, then stakeholder group A will be very happy and will want to use that to achieve a specific range of impacts. If on the other hand, uh, we actually disprove uh, outcome A and actually our research uh, has outcome B, then stakeholder group A are now going to be very unhappy and will not be able to do the things that they wanted. But potentially another group of stakeholders will be very happy at that result. And there would be a whole series of ways in which they would want to work with those research outcomes to deliver different um, research impacts. Um, and it may uh, be that we want to actually uh, recognise that we do not know the outcome, that it is contentious, and that we will work with both sides of that debate uh, as independent researchers, um, and uh, in so doing, mitigate some of the risks to the losing side, uh, so to speak, um, if our research ends up demonstrating that uh, there is um, one outcome which is um, preferentially better than another, or if we disprove something which uh, one group holds very dearly. Um, so, so I think you can, um, it, this kind of technique can help you to think, you know, use a tool like this to be a bit more sophisticated about the, the, the messy reality of impact. This boils it down to this very simple linear thing, and that for me is really powerful in terms of project planning, clarifying your thinking, making this persuasive in terms of your research proposal. Uh, the reality, of course, is often much more complex. But definitely, you cannot escape from that. It gives you, it's a perfect tool for answering some critical questions that if you just try to reflect them on, uh, on a Word document in a paragraph, definitely you're going to miss a lot of that essential piece of information that are included in this table. So with the table, you cannot escape. That's for sure. Yeah. Excellent. So th there was one thing I thought, if we've got time, I would uh, maybe just show you how um, I... Um, evaluate and, and monitor impacts as I go in these projects. So we, we could, this is the kind of the pre-award stuff. Um, and then post-award, we've got this plan. We can now make it happen. Um, but at the same time, increasingly, there is a focus on uh, actually trying to, 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 capture, uh, to capture our impacts. Uh, and I think it's important that, that we know whether things are working or not so that we can course correct. Uh, and uh, increasingly our funders uh, are expecting us to be able to evidence that yes, this did actually work. Um, uh, and if you look at the trajectory in terms of European funding, um, there is some quite high level discussion about what will replace Horizon 2020 and the role of evidencing and tracking impact and demonstrating the impact of European funding for society um, uh, in what replaces Horizon 2020. So I think there is uh, only going to be an increasing focus on impact. Uh, and increasingly, we will be expected to be held to account uh, and to be able to actually uh, demonstrate and evidence that what we said we would do in terms of impact actually did happen in some shape or form. Um, and that's a problem for me because um, actually a lot of the time uh, this is quite boring, it's not motivational, um, uh, and uh, as a result, I don't track this stuff, I don't measure it, um, and then someone comes and asks me for this evidence, and actually now I'm trolling through emails, and trolling through my calendar for potentially years, and I can remember the person I spoke to, I can remember the company, I can remember where I was anywhere, but can I fund it? Uh, it's a nightmare. So I've developed a technique um, using the free productivity app, Evernote, um, that works for me. Uh, I think for you, just ask yourself, um, if I do not track this stuff as I go, why don't I do it? What are the barriers and what technique could I use that would overcome those barriers? So for me, I need something that will work on my phone because I'm out and about a lot. I need something that uh, I don't have to be able to log into a website. It doesn't have to even be online um, uh, and something that can work wherever I am, whatever program I'm using. So. Um, uh, the system that I use um, uh, uh, has one bit of functionality that I pay for. So you can use everything apart from this one thing for free on Evernote. Um, they charge me £30 per year, um, similar price in euros, um, to be able to email them perhaps into the app. Um, so uh, that means, therefore, that I get an email in and I can just now ping this off to my Evernote email address and it just drops into the app and I can then see that 
through the online interface if I want, or uh, on my phone or on my desktop. Um, but within less than a second, um, I've just pinned it away and I'm still reading my emails. There's a little thing that I can add into my browser so I can then clip the web page. So uh, even if the web page just appears, I've got a, a photograph of it and I can see that it did happen, really, believe me. Um, and without having to even leave my web browser, I've clipped it and it's stored there. Uh, or on Twitter, I, I'm on my phone, I, I see something that's really important, I, I'm just now sending that to my Evernote, Evernote email address, it drops in. At the same time, uh, I can uh, drag and drop documents in, uh, uh, write notes in, etc. and it's all there in, in one place, and it's searchable, etc. My team members um, are able to uh, interact with this uh, just using email, or they can have the uh, the uh, the, the, the app on their phone, they can have it now share so they can see all of the impacts for our project on their phone, they can do it online, uh, whatever. But the point for me is there's no excuse. If you can use email, and you can report your impacts to me and they just all send these in. Uh, it, it comes into my Evernote, I can, uh, I can see that, it's shared with anyone who wants to see it. Uh, and I can follow up on that um, uh, with people in detail. So if you want to see what this looks like, um, I, I'm just gonna go to my, uh, my website again. And uh, it is just on the, the home page. <clears throat> and you can see there's an Evernote thing here. Mm -hmm. Click on Evernote and it just explains how this works. Uh, as I said, I use this um, uh, using this one bit of extra functionality. I pay 30 pounds, my team gets it all for free. Um, one important disclaimer is to mention that this um, is a, a cloud-based service based in the US, so this is the same as things like Dropbox. Uh, it's not covered by EU data protection legislation, so if you're going to put um, commercially sensitive data, that kind of thing, uh, on this, um, then just beware uh, that you're not uh, covered uh, for that. Uh, so for me, with Dropbox, I use that all the time, and I'll just make sure there's a, a folder that for anything very sensitive takes me to a, a folder in my university server. Uh, and you can do the same with, with Evernote if you do want to use it for stuff that's personal um, or, or, or very sensitive. Um, and so in here, you, it shows you the example of one of the other templates I've not used. I build this into my um, Evernote and, and track this using a traffic light uh, system as well. I maybe go a bit further than most people want to with this, but um, for me, this is a very quick and easy way of uh, enabling you to keep a track of this simply without having to um, uh, having to spend lots of time on it. Um, so hopefully, hopefully useful for, for people. Well, and uh, I guess that uh, this could be very useful for um, um, uh, for consortia during the post award phase. That they want uh, it's not only one organization or one person that wants to track the progress towards uh, an expected impact. So you can have this ever not uh, model shared by the other consortium members. In that respect, every one of them can uh, track and contribute to this table that you have uh, uh, shared in, uh, in the template in order to track what is going on during a two, three, four years. Yeah. And then you just have that and you, you, when you make the report, you just take an information, you consolidate it, and you're ready. And there is no evidence that is lost. Well done. There's exactly, yeah. And I, I encourage people just to put as much as they can in there, uh, whether or not you think it's relevant, because then it's very easy for me to sift through when I'm reporting and say, right, I want more information about that. I go and talk to this person. Yeah, that's not relevant, not relevant. Great, I want this. Um, and it just makes the reporting process so much simpler, so much easier. Um, and if you want to use it for PR purposes, I want to create a case study, whatever it is, it's, it's all there, it's, it's simple, and you don't have to remember it. Um, so it's just about making this as painless and as quick and as simple as, as possible. Um, so, so yeah, but the point is whether you use the system that I developed or your own system, you're finding a way to make sure that with your team you make a habit of everyone tracking the stuff as they go so that you as the PI are not ending up with a problem later on um, and a harder job later. If you don't record it, you lose it for sure. <laughs> it has to be recorded, yeah. anything that you do, for sure. Well, uh, Mark, at this uh, point I would really like to thank you. I have. Uh, uh, honestly enjoyed uh, this uh, session. It was uh, interactive, it was informative, and uh, by far it was sharing a lot of uh, knowledge, tools, templates, that, uh, that I'm sure it's, uh, 
very useful for anyone that wants to deal successfully with impact session, either in a national or in a European funding project like uh, or proposal like Horizon 2020. So thank you, Mark, for your contribution and uh, keep it.